Welcome, everybody, to another Vita Learning Webinar. Today we've got uh, Felix Pages uh, giving us a presentation. Hi, Felix. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. All right. Excellent. So today we're going to go with uh, Felix. He's going to talk about zirconia, achieving the desired natural income um, outcome. Uh, income as well. It'll hopefully give you some income. Uh, so that's that's very important. Uh, today, just a couple uh, housekeeping things. You, everyone is on mute. So at the end of the program, we'll do some uh, present uh, some questions and answers. So on the right hand side of your screen in the panel, uh, there is a question box. Just type in your question and send it. And then we'll we'll sort through those and, and have those questions at the end of the program. So everyone is on mute, use the question box. Uh, Q and A will be at the end of the program. It is going to be recorded. So if you miss something or need to elaborate some more elaboration or to readdress something, we will have the recording on our Vita Learning website, the Vita North America YouTube channel, and so forth. So please visit that channel. There is uh, other Felix Pages programs that he's done in the past um, for us and for you on various topics as well as other uh, products uh, that Vita uh, continues to sell. So uh, they're calling it Achieving the Desired Natural Outcome with Felix Pages. Now Felix um, is a 1976 honors graduate from the University of Kentucky. Lexington Technical Institute. At the time that I I'm also went through a technical institute, but at the time that they actually had them in the United States, right, Felix? Not so many left yeah. anymore. It's like six. Uh, <laughs> after you graduated, you worked with the prosthodontic uh, faculty at the University of Florida College of Dentistry and collaborated with uh, Dr. Harry Lundeen and other members of the faculty. In 1978, Felix relocated to California with the Unitech Corporation, a precursor to VITA, and worked as a course instructor for VITA. Uh, the following year, Felix was promoted to the laboratory project manager for all new products. Uh, that was in the heyday of, of exciting uh, new products, right, Felix? Absolutely. Uh, during that time, Felix traveled and taught courses in many parts of the world presented at domestic and international meetings. Uh, Felix is a founding member of the IFDC and was the first keynote speaker for the group in 1983. Uh, he was invited to speak at the first Quintessence Ceramic Symposium in 1984. He's also a founding member of the Claude Sieber Art and Experience Group. And among, among other recognitions, uh, he received uh, the FDLA uh, Crowning Achievement Award in 2011 for his contributions to the dental laboratory industry. Felix is currently a key opinion leader for Vita North America and America Dental Group. So again, welcome, Felix. Thank you. I am going to make you the presenter. And so you will... Then go ahead and bring up your presentation. So you are now the presenter. There we go. All right. So I, I see you're wearing, you're, you have a um, safety that's my, uh, mask on. That's my coronavirus look. No, no, that's just a slide. <laughs> Yeah. I just thought you were being overly cautious. You know, you never know nowadays, no, no, right? No, no I'm, in my, I'm in my kitchen, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Felix, I am going to uh, turn this over to you. Uh, so I'm going to disappear, and you can start your presentation, okay? Thank you. Okay. Can you guys see everything all right? Yes, everything's good. Oops. Let's go back one. Okay, so the welcome everybody. Uh, 
I did a lot of work for this presentation, and every time I would see a few things, I'd say, you know what, I have to add more, and I have to add more, and I have to add more. So we're going to move through this as, as quickly as possible, but I'll try to stop at an hour and a half exactly like I did the last time. Um, the goals of the seminar, as Jim pointed out, is selection of zirconia materials by translucency and opacity, manipulation of internal and external colors, best practices for shaping frameworks pre and post uh, sintering, and internal wash applications to shift external optical results. I'll put a little bit more than that in there because anterior aesthetics is really difficult. But if I miss something, go ahead and ask me at the end and I might have an answer for you. If you go back to the first slide, you see where it says here that I BS, I'm not a BS. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an associate degree. Somebody's trying to make me feel better, but I do BS. So beauty really is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, I have been around the block a few times and it never ceases to amaze me what people really want in their mouth or how they feel that they look better by having teeth of a certain shape, color, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I must say that men don't seem to care as much the older men especially, younger men a little bit more uh, uh, demanding of a certain look. So anterior aesthetics is really complicated. I mean, you have the patient's wants trump the patient's needs. And most dentists cave to the patient's wants because they'll walk out the door and go to another dentist. And labs sometimes, or a lot of times, have to swallow their pride and do what they know they could do a better job at. And the big problem here is that you have to know the target, period. I mean, I tell a lot of the patients that this is not like a nail salon where you can just dip your fingernail and change the color or something. And so they may start off wanting something, but they really don't know what they want until they look at it. They'll bring a, a high school picture or something, and, and obviously you can't even see the teeth. So a lot of times it's a psychological situation and you have to be very delicate because there's a lot of very sensitive people these days. And one of my favorite lines is the uh, great expectations is a novel by Charles Dickens. <laughs> That's all it is. If you, if you over promise and under deliver, you'll never get anywhere. So you have to really think about what you're doing uh, especially when you present these scenarios to patients that you're going to make you look like somebody special. It's just, you know, you have to be careful. So anterior aesthetics includes not just the teeth, the tissue, the smile line, many other things, the face, the frame. So let's look at a few teeth and see what our target is. That good looking kid is my grandson. He's like six feet tall now. If you look at some of these teeth, these, this is a gradual aging process. And as these teeth grow, the occlusion is what drives the anterior aesthetics. It may sound funny to you, but if you have an angle of eminencia that's rather flat, like a bulldog, like my jaw is, I wear my teeth flat. I wipe out all these beautiful effects that happen in the incisal third of the tooth, maybe three millimeters from the incisal edge originally and up is where you see all the good looking stuff. Occasionally you'll see some other, other things. So the color of the teeth, like I'll get into a little bit later, is a combination of optical color produced by light striking hydroxyapatite crystals, and then the cementum and dentine, calcified dentine, opacious dentine, secondary dentine, sclerotic dentine, it goes on and on and on. And after you go through and study all this, they'll say, well, I want an OM1. Okay, thank you very much. And so the problem is, is that hair gets whiter and teeth get darker. It's not the other way around. And to me, one of the worst things is to see like an 80 year old with a denture <laughs> with B1 shader or lighter. I mean, it just doesn't look normal. And it's easier to make white crowns than to make natural looking crowns. So if your lab continuously wants to make white crowns because the dentist wants to make white crowns, you will be replaced. 
faster than somebody that can do this. So it's amazing after all these years of, of fighting this, everybody wants white teeth, a lot of the lab owners are having a hard time finding a quote unquote a ceramist. I mean, you know, somebody that applies porcelain or whatever, I've never really heard those terms and master ceramist, never heard that one either. I mean, I don't know where it came from, but a lot of people are calling themselves master ceramists. And the larger the case, the easier the colors, really not a big deal. And most of the libraries are fairly decent and you can mill out a big zirconia thing. But the biggest problem is the lack of restorative material knowledge. The dentists really uh, can compromise the aesthetics that could be achieved by using the best material for certain targets. So here's a group of banditos that attended a course of mine in Long Island, New York. The one with the hair on the teeth is Mickey Woke, the uh, <laughs> great sales rep in New York. Alwyn works for the largest Seric practice. Uh, I don't know the other two. I can't remember them all, but they're all still <clears throat> beautiful teeth with characterizations and none of them resemble white and they come in all age groups. And so it, you don't have to have perfectly white teeth when you're born. I mean, there's all kinds of situations. So if you take a closer look at the targets, what happens if you have a situation where a tooth is broken in half like that? So you're, you're going to have an area that has absolutely no space at all. And then all of a sudden, you're going to have a really, really thick area. And if you really, the doctor builds that up, it's very hard to etch and bond the resin and that little bit of enamel. So this is an accident, of course. And there's really uh, not, a, not an easy way to do these things. But when you, the closer you look, the more stuff you find inside the teeth. If you look at this beautiful uh, anterior teeth, you can see a halo, which is the light exiting the, the fine edge of the tooth. And just inside, you see the bluish, which is an optical illusion. This is known as Rayleigh scattering, and that is uh, hydroxyapatite crystals reflect the short wave light, which is bluish, and let the yellow orange long waves through. If there's any dentist listening, uh, all you do is you put a mirror on the the tongue side of the teeth and you shine a light through it and all the teeth look yellow orange on the lingual because the tooth itself is filtering out the short wave light blue and pushing it out. If you put the light outside the mouth, I mean inside the mouth, all the teeth on the facial will look yellow. So the tooth is an active participant in manipulating light, especially the enamel hydroxyapatite crystals, which range in size from 0.2 to 4.0. 0.4 microns, which is within the curve, the, the, the peak and the trough of, of a white light wave. So the reason that these things look blue is known as Rayleigh scattering. And that is any time a wavelength of light hits a particle smaller than 0.4 microns, it pushes out the, the short wavelengths bluish and, and allows the, the long waves, yellow and orange and red to pass. So the inside of these teeth, these are called developmental lobes. People always call them mammalons and mammalon effects and all this business has nothing to do with a mammalon. That is an internal developmental lobe and inside are flanked by developmental grooves which look a little softer and bluish. So if you strip these teeth in, in phosphoric acid, it will allow, you'll see the dentine and the lobes, the enamel goes away. And there you can see how an internal structure of a tooth is built. And that's what we've always tried to do when we're trying to match, especially these single teeth, which really is not a fun job and it certainly doesn't make you any money, but somebody's got to do it. You can see here this beautiful soft blue. That's, you have to learn the colors in your kit and you have to say, well, what that thing sort of looks like that blue and sizal that I have, but I'm not really sure. Well, you better be sure you're going to be grinding it out. And so the whole idea of aesthetics in a natural tooth is contrast of translucency and opacity and soft colors that could seep up from the incisal edge. I don't know what you eat, but it could be something like this, diet related, 
And of course, there's age changes. So the teeth are always changing in color. Crowns do not. So I never criticize old crown and bridge work because at one time it might have looked pretty darn good. And here you see the uh, enamel lamellae, the little crack lines that you see. And they're just beautiful. And the reason that the enamel doesn't fall off, even though it's cracked, is because it's fused to the dentine. And the dentine is flexible. So it's sort of like, uh, what is it, the M&Ms? Hard candy shell and a soft milk chocolate inside. That's what it is. And so if the dentine did not flex, 37 gigapascals is the flexural strength of dentine, which is almost identical to the enamic material that Dr. Giordano developed for that reason. So you have this flexion to keep things from breaking. And so all of those are, they're nice to put in, but most people don't want them. They want to buy a brand new car and they don't want any dents and dings in it, but they sometimes look ridiculous when they walk out with these super white teeth. And so if this is about a natural look, let's, let's investigate a little further. What can I say about this guy? He has limited uh, incisal characterizations, just a little bit on some of the laterals. And of course that tooth got dinged. I can't remember uh, what happened, but he told me the story. And of course, you know, that's not an easy job to fix that. So when you take a shade, I still hold on to the select the value first and everything else falls in line so that the eye to me can certainly determine the value before anything else. That's why people are always screaming, either the crown is too bright or it's too gray. And there's several reasons why they look bright and there's several reasons why they look great, especially with zirconia applications. So let's get into it a little bit more. So here you can see a color picture of group two. And with some really detailed photography, you can actually see the difference between the yellow and the red between the L2.5 and R2.5, which is a slight difference. And so you see the eye is quite sensitive to this. And you can you can really pick out the colors. In my particular case, my two front teeth, one is a, a reddish shade and the other one's a yellowish shade. So I have like a 4L 1.5 and a 4R 1.5. And I can't remember which one is which. I still have my teeth, so. But you see, when you do these the photography, you have to make sure you don't get any flashback or glare backs everywhere because you ruin the information that you're trying to that you're trying to get. So this this is lit from the very top where it'll illuminate the tab and uh, you can see some really distinct colors. If uh, you shoot this from the front and try to get that picture, it, you're going to see highlights of flash everywhere, especially on a smooth shiny surface. So when I take a shade, I use the 3D shade guide. Beware of the big one start using the linear because I opened uh, one of these tabs up not so very long ago and, and one of the other tabs went right up the guy's nose. <laughs> and I thought it was kind of funny. But anyway, I use a little linear guide now. This is the old one before the linear guide. So you see, you have a pretty darn close match to a 1M1, but there's some stuff going on inside that tooth. And so we have all kinds of things where you can pick the color and all this stuff. Uh, the bridge you see up there, that's actually a, a bridge that was made at a course with Rolf Ankley in Brazil. And that is a uh, PFM bridge with all kinds of goodies in it. And I just showed, showed these uh, select enamels and select dentines and stuff just to kind of as a guide of how you can use these things. I don't think Vita makes them anymore, so you really should make your own shade tabs anyway. So this is how I lay out my drawings on difficult teeth. So this happens to be an, another case, which is a 2M2, 2M1. And what I do is I take the porcelain on a glass slab and I put little bits and pieces of the porcelain that I'm gonna use. And I actually pick it up right off of that white tile, 92 white, Italian tile. It's a, like a foot long and just, a, just like a floor tile, but it's super smooth and super white. And so I scribe out everything that I have to do and then I pick it up from there. It's sort of like paint by numbers. 
And then I use these little special little tabs, and I'll show you how to make them. And I characterize these uh, with my stains, uh, which I try to match to internal color. So for instance, if you really think uh, logically about this, you sometimes have room to use a powder material to produce this bluish. A lot of times you don't have room. So you need to match the color of the stains that you have available to you with the enamel modifiers, density modifiers, whatever. And then you say, okay, I see that blue. That could be T5 in the old system or effect enamel nine, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's what you have to match. And so you have colors that you can use inside if you want to build it up. If not, you can stain these. So I hate the word stain. I use color. I'm going to go color your crown. I'm not going to stain your crown because they don't like that word. So here, I learned this in a body shop uh, when I got a car a long time ago. A woman ran into it, a little dent. And the guy at the body shop that looked like Willie Nelson came out and he painted some green paint on the door right where she smashed it. It was a tiny thing. And when he couldn't see where he put the paint, that was the match. So I said, well, heck, I can do that with my teeth. So I get my stains and I paint them right next to something I see inside the tooth. And that way I already know what I have to put inside. I may do a first bake, smooth it, and then I characterize it, and then I, I set the stain. Don't try to stain a, a rough surface because it's, it's not very good. You need to smooth it out so that the stain flows nicely. And then you see, you hold it up there and you can subtract or add, and then you can see what's going on. I'm gonna be making number eight. Number nine is the goal, the target. So you see what I did? You can see the colors there that I used. The one in the closest to the midline is a little too yellow, and then I mixed it with a little white and I put it right in the middle. And then of course you can see the soft bluish. Those are the easiest to reproduce. So this is a slice of a leftover Vita block, and I shaped it like a central. So if I glued it onto those little clear sticks, I don't know the name of them, but they're quite handy, and I cut a slot in it with a disc, stick it in there and glue it in. And if I flip it, just turn it, I have number eight or number nine, whatever I want. <laughs> and this is a very good way uh, to take shade, a custom shade. And you can pull that off and fire it in the furnace and lock it in. They're about half a millimeter thick, between 0.5 and 0.7, which are workable. Workable. This is a Vita block, I believe it's an A2. And there you see how soft and translucent it is. And you can see the brush right through it. So you have practical working limits to where you sometimes want to block out what's underneath and other times you can use it to your advantage. The main thing to remember, see I put a little blob of orange stain and you can see right through it, it's too, you know, that's way too strong. And here you see the characterizations on the inside of the ledge and then I can fire that and take it to the lab and try to build, it, build another one like it. So the other thing that I do routinely is I take, uh, uh, lead press on nails or whatever, you know, those fake nails, plastic, and I scan them and I mill them out. And that's basically a half of a prep. So I can take those lead press on nails, put try and cement. I have them at 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and one millimeter on a couple of shades. And then I stick it right on the prep and I can put it under the gum and you can sterilize them because they're made out of beta block. And that way, I can see exactly what I have to use and it gets me a lot closer. So it's not that you're going to make it perfect, but you can certainly Im improve your predictability of how your shade is going to come out because you're trying something that's a reasonable thickness right on top of a tooth prep with some try and cement. I mean, I don't know how closer you can get. I also thought of using the den mat, those, what do you call it? The no prep veneers. But I haven't tried those yet. That could be another tool that you could use to paint those and uh, try it on before you, you know, you, you do your final uh, build up or whatever. So the most important part 
is, are color effects and contrast in the incisal region to develop aesthetics. You don't hardly see anything going on in the middle of the tooth or whatever, unless it's really an older patient and you have all kinds of stuff going on. But typically, if you can match those incisal edge effects, incisal area effects, let's say two to three millimeters up, you, you're gonna do okay. So let's go over some veneers. This, these are all Dr. Blanco, my good friend here in Miami. He's a ACD guy, um, was on the board. I don't know, he's busy with his kids at, at, in, at Florida State now, so he's backed off a little bit doing the right thing. So when you have to do these things, you say to yourself, look at the different colors of the preps. And these veneers are really thin. And you're gonna see the difference when we finish. There's really, I may have picked another block, but it's very acceptable. So here you see how we measure. We use a stump shade from Ivoclar. Dr. Blanco uses a digital caliper. He really measures everything. And then what I did is I milled out a couple of uh, veneers with Vita blocks and I characterized them with VM9 porcelain. And this material, Vita blocks, to me, are the best things ever made. They are like 30 years old or some crazy thing now. And they melt at like 11 or 1200 Celsius. So they're not going to warp. They're not going to do any of this. So you can actually try these in, shape them, build them up, fire it, color it, do whatever you want. And just barely, barely air braid the inside, like barely. And uh, put them in and that's it. So they're very workable. So I build this up. I highlight my line angles, and there you can see most of the preps are super gingival that Dr. Blanco does. So uh, it's almost like a contact lens effect with these, and you can see that there's a slight color difference between those two teeth. But the lady uh, did not want whiter teeth. Of course, she's got dark teeth everywhere else. So she didn't start off by doing two centrals white and then doing the rest of them. She likes how she looks. Is it perfect? No, but it's pretty darn close. And there's a measurement on those. They're like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 millimeters in a couple of spots. Here's another one. This is how we treat the case. So I photograph all this while he's while he's working. So we clean up the veneers and we use a red a yellow filter to take the UV light cure and uh, make sure that everything is absolutely clean. We hold the we hold the implants. I mean the veneers and tack them on. And by the time we're done, uh, we floss everything through nice and clean before the final curing. And we get some outstanding results that way. And there you see the final product. They're both super gingival. And uh, actually that those seem to be cleaned up a little bit. <laughs> I had to get out of the office. I was tired of being in there. So let's do a veneer next to a crown. These happen all the time. So here's the preps, a broken tooth, a buildup with some type of a fiber post, et cetera, et cetera. We take the shades and then the provisionals. And here's the models. And then what we do is we do a try-in, the same thing, I build it up. And then we do a try-in for the fit. We make sure everything is seated correctly and they're still super gingival preps. And then we go through the same bonding procedure. We used to have this, I don't think we make it anymore, but you can make uh, make it out of like a flowable or something and to hold your crowns while you work, you see? So here's the, here's the veneers and the crown and I match them. I match the prep color with the simulate material and try to get them to look as close as possible. And they do our favorable UV uh, reaction. And I'll get a little bit more into that. Uh, so it's really a fantastic all around product. And so you can mix it with translucent or whatever you want until you get it to match the prep. That way, when you put the veneer with a little liquid, whatever on it, you stain it. If you need to match a shade, you'll, you already know what the stump shade is 
and it increases your predictability of success by a lot when you do this this way. So here's the first one seated, super gingival. Then we try the crown and then we spot it in little by little until we get it to seat. And the last step, we try it in. I got to polish it a little bit more. Uh, that was in 2011. So um, I did polish it back then, I promise. <laughs> And so you see how it plays uh, very nicely with the lower incisor, the incisal edge effects. So all you have to do is look at the lower incisors when you, when you try to do the upper anteriors and you see all this little contrast of translucency and opacity. You just match that and have the patient move end to end. And that's the perfect uh, determinant for what colors you're gonna use to characterize uh, two to three millimeters up from the incisal edge. Uh, people like Claude Sieber don't come along every day. Uh, he photographed this. That's one of my ex-girlfriends. And he was just an exceptional person. And he's out of dentistry now. But uh, sometimes God sends people your way to open your eyes up. And this guy certainly opened a lot of eyeballs. As an old friend, Dr. Mark Fisher in Miami said, there's a, a lot going on inside that tooth. And that was the first time I heard anybody say that. And, he, and it was so true because you see some teeth <laughs> that have so much stuff going on there that they're actually easier to make than one that is absolutely the same color from top to bottom. You have to remember that the, the thicknesses vary within the crowns. And what we're trying to do to match a single anterior tooth or even the two front teeth to the rest of them, it's really not easy to, to do it the right way. So how about choosing the proper restorative material? The dentist is the one that calls most of the shots here, and he needs to be proactive about what restorative materials he can use to, to better match a target. And for the last quite a few years now, not just a few, it's been only about zirconia. And even though incredible progress has been made, there's still a, li a few little things lacking, but they're getting closer and closer all the time to making a really nice looking zirconia. And again, like anything else, if you're doing the whole mouth or the whole arch, it's a lot easier than if you're doing parts of it. So let's look at the difference between natural teeth and zirconia. So natural teeth are organic and, and mineral. That is the crystalline structures in the tooth enamel and the organic material the proteins and the cementum and the dentine and everything else that composes a beautiful tooth. And there's layers of these different materials. They're, they are individually developed teeth. There's no teeth that look the same. So it's a never ending challenge to try to match the teeth. The refractive index changes with age. That's how the tooth bent, the tooth enamel bends the light. It's similar to if you, if you sit on the edge of a pool and you put your leg in there, you see how your leg bends because the light rays are going through air, which has a refractive index of one as a standard. And uh, water is like 1.3, saliva is 1.33, tooth enamel is 1.62 so that the porcelains that have refractive index due to the particle size of the outermost layer, like opal effects and things like this, if they're close between 0.2 and 0.4 microns in a glass matrix, you can really achieve some nice aesthetics because the light is being bent exactly like the tooth enamel is. The opacity of the teeth change with age, the fluorescence and dentine and cementum, and lack of, of, of any mentionable fluorescence in the tooth enamel allows for some beautiful things that happen in the tooth when it undergoes, uh, when it's viewed under different light sources. And I'll get into that. It is a shock absorber because the dentine flexes and absorbs shock. And there's infinite shades and characterizations. With zirconia, you basically have a monolithic material you may have what you know a multi-layer or multi whatever you want to call it uh, look. There's some zirconias that have three different types of zirconias. 
uh, in the mix and there's some tension between each layer but we we i spoke about that in my last lecture uh the material is birefringent or double refractive so basically what happens is the particle size of the zirconia is so tiny it's it's a two tenths of a micron uh, typically and what and they're they're all a little different but what happens is that when the light comes in uh, it's bouncing off the grain boundaries and also the grains. So let's say if I held up a translucent, beautiful chunk of calcium bicarbonate it, or zirconia, and I have a line drawn on my desk, and I look down, it'll look like two lines. So that's known as a biofringent material. So typically what's exhibited in zirconia is that you pat yourself on the back and say oh look how good my crown looks it's beautiful and it matches the shade guide perfect and then you go put it in the mouth and it looks way too bright and that's because the light's coming in from only the front whereas when you have a crown outside the mouth you have 360 light coming in and it negates uh, a lot of this double refraction you can look all that up i have uh, some reading references that you can use uh, zirconia is the best antibacterial material. Bacteria hates it because it has nowhere to go. It's so solid that we don't even glaze the part of the crown, put glaze or anything on it uh, from the tissue level to the implant level. That is a no-no to put glaze on there and also on the occlusal surface. And I'll talk about that a little later. And when polished properly, it cannot wear tooth enamel because the particles are smaller. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. but if you, if a dentist grinds the occlusion after it's cemented and he doesn't do a really good job polishing that, your goose is cooked because that will shred the teeth like a cheese grater. And so that's the problem with the zirconia. It's getting better, but it's not perfect yet. So what about these materials? Uh, what do you use? If you look at this, this was put up by I don't know who in the internet, and somebody sent this to me, and it's someone in South America, and uh, he, he did a pretty decent job. So here you have Suprinity, Emacs, Enamic, Mark II, VitaBlock, YZ, the original, VM9, and VM13. And you can see under different lighting sources, especially in the fluorescent one, where the YZ material, the zirconia, just goes black. And the same thing with Emacs. And all you have to do is put fluorescing materials in there, which I'll talk about in a second, but that's not necessarily a panacea to match the natural teeth. The natural tooth exhibits the most fluorescence in the dentine and cementum, not in the enamel. So if you have a monolithic material and you put a little bit too much fluorescent and it's gonna glow in the dark, similar to the tooth on the right, <laughs> And so that sample on the right. And so you have in the effect liner on the VM9 and then the Lumex, we have a new power wash, which you put way deep inside on top of the, the structure, the zirconia, when you layer the Lumex material. And it does a very nice job of producing fluorescence. So I'll explain why fluorescence is important in your everyday crowns. So if you look at the... The Journal of Dental Materials, uh, these investigators use the Toso Zirconia powder, which is called Zpex, Zpex Smile, and another one they have that's a little stronger, the, the, the old 3Y material. And they used a, a rare earth element called Thulium, T-H-U-L-I-U-M, Thulium. And that fluoresces perfectly at a millimeter, I mean, it looks exactly, except it's super expensive. And so again, you have to be very careful how much, if they're gonna make any of these, if you put too much in the zirconia mix, you're artificially, you're gonna look funny in a black light environment. Now, for years, the argument was, well, we got fluorescent, so when we walk into a nightclub, my teeth are gonna look blue white, in under the black lights, et cetera. And some of the crowns used to look black, like the old dense supply material. And the first material to really look natural under black light was beta Dur S. 
That was the one that uh, Vita made after the McLean patent. And they had some fluorescers in it, rare earth elements. And uh, the British government uh, uh, told them to take it out because it was quote unquote radioactive. But you had like more on a watch, a pin on a on a watch dial that glows in the dark. Uh, a few of those little dots in a porcelain bottle. I mean, it's ridiculous. But that from there went Vita Duren, which went absolutely ugly and gray because of lack of the fluorescing material. And so the most important part of fluorescence, you can look at this article if you want to write this down: fluorescent property of human teeth. And dental calculus for clinical applications. I found this fascinating. And what they use the black light for these guys is if you're doing a resin, which actually fluoresces any like plastic and Vita teeth or a lot of plastic, anything fluoresces like crazy. And so what they do is when they do a filling, they use a black light when they're finishing the filling to see where the tooth starts and stops basically. So they clean up the resin, which is more fluorescent than the tooth, under this black light. But you can read this, you can download this article, Journal of Biomedical Optics. Uh, right there, you see it on the bottom. So you can take a screenshot of that if you want. The bottom line is, is fluorescence is important, but you have to watch where you put it. So what causes human teeth to fluoresce? There's these little tiny guys called fluorospores in the dentine and cementum. And they may have found a couple in the enamel, like the dentino enamel uh, surf area, but hardly nothing. And you have to look at this under 300, and that's a misprint, it's a 365 nanometer light that causes the tooth to respond. I have a couple of different uh, black lights that I tried and I spoke to Jim I said I've tested everything I can't get anything to fluoresce and then I went and uh, did my research and these guys were the ones that called out that you needed a uh, shorter wave further away from the visible spectrum so 395 uh, nanometer lights you can buy anywhere for like 20 bucks but they're they're not the right uh, nanometer length to excite the fluorospores. You need uh, 365. And you can get them on Amazon for about 20 bucks. I've got pictures at the end of the lecture. And so the importance of fluorescence in natural teeth is that they respond to normal daylight <laughs> and it causes the tooth to become more brilliant. And it allows for a closer representation of a human tooth a whiter and brighter aspect, minimizing the artificial gray aspect of having no fluorescence. So a lot of times it might look under one good light, you go outside and everything kind of dims a little gray, it's because the material doesn't have fluorescence. So Vita has always tried to produce a powder uh, that fluoresces to help the whole tooth come out. And this is of course the, the liners and in the older system with Claude Sieber, when we were working on, on the VM lines and before that the omega and alpha lines, we had what were called luminaries, which were highly fluorescent, rather larger crystals. And what that would do is it would transport the light everywhere. So it would be like a fiber optic and you would put a little bit of light in there. And some of those restorations were the most beautiful ever made. And so you look at UV light and you say to yourself, hmm, what the heck is all this about? So you can find, uh, it's funny because I bought this slide and it says you can detect urine, uh, scorpions, uh, all kinds of things with this uh, 395 nanometer light. If you see this graph on the right, you see how close you are to 400, which almost starts visible light. So you get a very, very minor UV response when you have a 395, you need it to be at 365. That's when the teeth pop and most everything else pops. When you start going below uh, 360, then you get into different UVs, even, even UVC, as you can see here on the left, is shortwave UV, effective germicidal potential, disrupts DNA, 
to inactivate microorganisms blocked by the atmosphere harmful to humans. So I happen to have a UVC light, two of them in my air conditioning units at home here, where it gets zapped before it goes through and after. And so my air is uh, pretty much mold free and germ free. The only bacteria in the house is me. And then you see UVB and UVA are fluorescent or black light applications, like the ones we used to buy at Spencer's Gift for parties in college. Everything looked white, even like the fuzz on your, your, your t shirts and stuff. It's amazing. And so, what happens is that it has uh, large amounts of of uh, visible light. And when you get to 400, forget it. That's your visible light. And it does not allow any germ killing or anything. And you can't get a UV response from your teeth. However, what you're not seeing is a, the beautiful brilliance that the natural tooth takes to increase the brightness and everything without going gray. So true UV begins below 400, remember that. And here you can see Roy G. Biv, right? In this case, I put Vib, whatever it is, because the violet's over here on the left. So it's Roy G. Biv backwards. So the short wavelengths are red and yellow. The, the, I mean, the short wavelengths are the blue violet. Ultraviolet is below that. You can't see it with your naked eyes. It'll burn your butt though when you go out and get too much sun here. And the Roy G. Biv, the, the visible light, is how you can detect colors. So you have certain wavelengths for certain colors. And uh, those are called, uh, when, when they hit an object that's translucent, some of the particles scatter certain wavelengths of light, and those are known as interference shades. Here's the little light, see? This is 395 nanometer, automotive leaks like air conditioning, bodily fluids, blood, and scorpions. That cost me $9 at, uh, where was it? Advanced Auto Parts. And I tried everything and it didn't work. This one on the right is 365 UV. It's called The Beast. And I got it on Amazon for like 20 bucks and it charges by itself and it works beautiful. And so, here you can see the power wash um, that I lit on this, and you can see see that situation. And here's with 395 nanometers, there's nothing. And that's what I was telling Jim. I go, are you sure this stuff fluoresces? Because I can't get it to fluoresce. Then I started doing my homework. And uh, once I once I get on something, I can't stop until I figure it out. I mean, it really bothers me. And sometimes you can't get any information from the manufacturer or anything. It's almost like there's a knowledge disconnect from the people that make the stuff to the people that use the stuff. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. But, you know, maybe it's an old secret or whatever it is. I don't know what they put in there to make it fluoresce, nor do I care, as long as it has some fluorescence. But they should explain it a little better. Uh, to put uh, inquiring minds at peace. So let's talk about zirconia. Vita has, I think three now, they used to have the three Y, and hopefully you guys know the difference between three, four and five Y zirconia. Three Y is the original zirconia. Uh, four Y is a little bit more translucent. It has a little more yttria, a little less zirconia. And five Y is what they call anterior zirconia which is the most translucent, if I look at them as jigsaw puzzles. So if you have a three Y, you have a billion piece jigsaw puzzle like my mom and dad used to do. And they try to get me to do that and I, I, I just can't. And then the four Y would be like a hundred piece jigsaw puzzle and a five Y is like a baby puzzle. So you have much larger particles so the light goes through it. Think of ice crushed ice or what do they call those things in Italy, the shaved ice, that stuff's white as a ghost. But once you put the liquid in it, it takes on the color of the liquid. If you freeze an ice cube, a giant block of ice, slowly with no air, it's absolutely light. It goes right through. So you can think of, of the zirconia, the cubic zirconia as larger particles where they don't interfere so much. 
where the grain boundary does a little scattering, crystal, the, the cubic crystal does a lot less than let's say a super tiny little particle. So the old zirconia, the three Y is certainly the strongest, but it also can weaken in the mouth. The newer zirconias, the ST and the XT that are more cubic content, little, little more yttria, less zirconia, produces a more of a cubic phase. They are weaker to start, but they don't get weaker in the mouth. And that's, that's a, a plus. So typically the ST is the workhorse. That's around 850 megapascals. The XT is around 600 or so for anterior work. And it's quite beautiful. So here we just, uh, I just got a box of stuff of goodies from Jim that has the new multicolor zirconia. We had gradient, which is the same material. It just gets a little softer towards the incisal. And we also have now multicolor, which is really nice. And I have been, I've been down for the count the whole month of June because I messed my knee up and I could barely walk. So I haven't done a, I've got some crowns at ProLab in Naples that I have to, to get and look at them, uh, but I haven't done any real cases. And thank God, finally, they made uh, the 3D shades in multicolor. So now we have 1M1, 2M1, 3M1, 4M1, and I believe OM1. And that's gonna be really nice. I mean, I've been after this for years. It's why they don't make the one shades. I asked one guy once, show me how to make a 3M1 out of a 3M2 block. And of course, there's no answer for that. So now we don't have any excuses, none whatsoever. So I can't wait to start messing with these things. And I have to, I have to mill out. I, I'll use a puck and I'll, I'll use the whole puck up trying to make crowns that are 0.6, 0.7, you know, one millimeter, 1.5, and nest them the same to see really what they look like. Because there's no nowhere can you go look and say, what is this zirconia supposed to look like? I don't care who's who makes it. Nobody knows what it's supposed to look like. What if you cook it wrong in the first place? Just because it tells you cook it at 1530 and follow the directions, that doesn't mean they're, it, I mean, you just, you just never know. So there has to be at some point, someone takes the bull by the horns and say, this is what it's supposed to look like when it's cooked properly. And again, all of this is commensurate with thickness. So you could have a crown that's a millimeter and a half, it's gonna look different than a crown that's 0.7. So that, that's something you have to learn by feel. You just can't just like, oh, I'm gonna do this and you know, how many times are you going to do it over to get it right? That's what you test things for. And that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. So when you look at all these chemical properties and all this, these are all ISO numbers. Uh, if you see at the bottom, you can see the all the ISO spec specifications. And they all are well within the standards. And so they're really quite nice. I mean, we stick mostly with... Uh, with a four Y because we do a lot of bigger, bigger cases. I can't wait to try the other one. So if you look at this, the, the original translucent zirconia was about 32% translucent. Now, hopefully that's at a millimeter. See, that's the other thing they need to put down there. What, what is it at a millimeter? And that might be what those samples are. It just doesn't call it out. So I'm guessing. And then the HT is 42, the ST is 46, and the XT is 50% translucent. I have a funny story about that. I told these guys from Germany that they, they should have named XT, ST, and ST, XT. And they said, well, I said, they didn't understand. They didn't get it. And I said, have you ever heard of extra man? They said, no, uh, you've heard of Superman? Of course, Superman. I go, yeah, because super is bigger than extra. But who cares? We have now the most translucent is called XT. And that is a 36% increase in translucency from the original uh, YZ material. So hardly anyone uses the T anymore or the HT. 
Uh, we do use it for longer bridges, posterior, the HT, which is quite a bit. I mean, that's some strong stuff. And so you have to sort of fit the material to the needs. That's really the reality of it. And when you look at the firing temperatures on the bottom left of your slide, you see all these things like universal, 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 and all this. I mean, I cook everything. Like you have to do the HT at 1450. You can't do the other ones. There's about a 40 to 50 degree range that I've noticed that you could do anything. And these are in well calibrated furnaces to, to make the, the zirconia look a little more translucent. Most dentists that have Therac are searching no matter what, they have this high speed firing furnaces or whatever they use. And they're looking for some miracle to happen when they cook everything fast. And even Vita makes a block that's supposed to be, but we, I mean, in the lab, we look at all this and we say to ourselves, there's no way that this two hour or 20 minute bake or whatever, some incredible thing, some doctor called me, it just doesn't look the same when you cook this thing for a few hours. I mean, you know, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So when we started out, we used to color all the zirconia in all these liquids. They were acid based. They would eat up your furnace and everything around it. Then they went to low acid. It's really not water based because I put uh, I have a pH meter and it's it's always acid. So they can talk all they want about uh, water based anybody. It's not water. It's got may, may have a lot more water, but they're still acid. And I would take precautions. But most people are doing uh pre-shaded zirconia problem with that is is that unless you have a puck that happens to look like a tooth you're trying to match you're never going to get it right so a lot of this like the zircons on people all those really good technicians incredible they make unbelievable work they're, they're always painting the zirconia they make a structure that's colored already and they really are incredible now the one thing you have to remember is you can paint it or you can dip it whatever and if you have a pontic next to a a thin crown one it's either going to look too saturated or not saturated enough depending on, on how much you paint it the same thing goes for appreciated zirconia where you could have a molar pontic next to a second bicuspid that maybe is a millimeter thick or a millimeter and a half and you see a much more dense deader looking pontic than you would that abutment. So you have to think about those things. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, sometimes we had a, I can't remember, I believe it was origin. They made a liquid. Some people said it was water, but I, don't, I never used it. You paint it on the zirconia first, and then you put the color so it wouldn't soak in so deep into the pontic. And that way you could sort of make, make everything look, look the same which I thought was really clever and I should have thought about it, but I didn't. <laughs> so you have to remember with these things, they'll say, well, you do one stripe or one swipe, two swipes, three swipes. I mean, that really becomes difficult to control in a larger laboratory environment. You got to make sure you really, really clean everything up. And most people don't really want to do this anymore. It's not a lost art, but it's getting to be with the better and better looking pre-shaded zirconias. And of course, layered zirconias. You don't know how many bridges were cracked in the beginning when the beads would fall into the inner proximals of, a lar of an uncooked framework and then you shrink it and the beads would get into the inner proximals and would break. So you have to, you can't sink them in there too much. You need to make sure that the beads are not in the interproximal connectors because most of these zirconias are going to shrink 20 to 25%. So that you could start off with a bigger connector. Oh, the bead fits, fits in there perfect. Yeah, but by the time it shrinks down, you're going to crack the bridge. And then you say, why did this bridge crack? So some people are using cloth and all the other kinds of things. I still use the beads and I don't do that many. So. How about the opal effect in teeth, this bluish thing that you see? Like I said, the HA crystals, hydroxyapatite crystals are 0.2 to 0.4 microns, and that causes this blue-orange 
uh, interface. So short wavelength is 360, high wavelength is 720. And this is why the sky looks blue and the sunsets and sunrises are orange. It's known as Rayleigh scattering. Those two English scientists around 1830, 40, 50, that uh, were separating atmospheric gases. So they had these spheres uh, like you see in Jules Verne, like with glass and reinforced with this bent wood and they would just pressurize the hell out of it. And the light would come in and, uh, and uh, the, this, these, they started to notice that these colors were forming when the sunlight was passing through them and it wasn't, didn't look like air anymore. And so uh, the Tyndall was a commoner and R Lord Rayleigh was a, was a lord, he was royalty. And so Tyndall said, hey, I think this is what's happening. And then Rayleigh, quote unquote, proved it, went to his scientist friends and they called it Rayleigh scattering or the Tyndall effect. And this is why, this is why you see this orange and yellow sunset. So if you have silica, which is floating in the atmosphere all the time, just like this beautiful opal, that opal is made of colloidal silica and molecular water. And so what happens is when the earth melts and it hits the water, it traps the water and you have all different shapes of crystals. And when the light goes through, the white light has all the wavelengths and each particle of that silica bounces everything around and you get this opal. Now that's, that is a, a normal opal. If you heard of a fire opal, they grind it and put it against a black background. It looks yellow, orange, and red because the light, not all the light's going through. So the sand or microscopic silica in the atmosphere settles, the biggest particles settle closest to the Earth's surface. So when the sun comes up in the morning, it's going through large particles that are bigger than the wavelength of light from crest to trough, which is 0.4 microns. That means the whole particle can be bombarded by all the colors. And if you've ever seen a little grain of sand at the beach, they're full of rust, iron oxide, all kinds of minerals, and that's what gives it that orange, yellow, beautiful sunrise and sunset color. And as the sun moves up into the morning sky, it's going through submicronic silica, which is less than 0.4 microns, and that's where it only scatters shortwave light, and that's why it's blue. And the same reason the sky is blue is the same reason the enamel in your teeth are blue. It's known as Rayleigh scattering. Ambria and suprinity have the same effect, opal effect and fluorescence included in the price. Absolutely no charge. And they're, they're the best looking materials in the mouth. So if you have a pressing oven and you want to mill out some teeth and build up some Ambria, they're, they're stunning crowns. That's a lithium disilicate like, uh, like Emacs. We can't mill it yet, but I think we're working on it. And the other suprinity is a lithium silicate, not disilicate. And we'll go into that in a second. So how accurate is color reproduction in a crown? You have to remember two shades are a combination of pigment and optics. And if you don't have the right material in the crown to produce an opal effect or a fluorescing effect, uh, it's never going to match right. So the translucency of natural teeth vary uh, in the thickness and they can be very deceiving and they change color with age. So the enamel becomes more translucent, the dentine and cementum become more colorful, more chromatic. And that's why you see these darker looking teeth in older people. And the thicknesses of crowns vary so much that the opacity translucency ratio of each powder has to be learned at a reasonable thickness. So just because you said, oh, I prepped everything a millimeter and a half, well, I don't care what you prep. That doesn't mean that the porcelain is going to look like the tooth material at one or 1 1.2. And if somebody tells me that they, they reduce the tooth exactly everywhere the same, I'll, I'll sell you the bridge, or you can sell me the bridge from Brooklyn or whatever they say. The thing is, is that it's impossible to prep a tooth the same thickness everywhere. That's a big bunch of baloney. 
you've got real thin margin sometimes. You've got to cut the incisolettes two to three millimeters sometimes or more. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. So you have to really learn. You have to fire tabs and crowns so you can increase your predictability, improve it, and say, you know what, I, I think I know what I got to do here. Geller, Willie Geller called it, called it his sixth sense. And you start using a material and all of a sudden you're an expert, it doesn't work that way. You have to really, really know your stuff in order to be able to say, you know what, I kind of used that before. It looks like this, it looks like that. That's how you do it. So what happens in full contour zirconia, remember it's just one thing, we're not layering it yet. It's affected by the firing temperature and rate. So if you go much past 850, you burn the pigments out of the zirconia. And if you've done these enough, and you used to fire higher fusing porcelain on it or just glaze it really high, uh, every time you cook it, it loses a little color in the framework. Lower fusing ceramics like Lumex and, and quite a few others uh, fire around 750, and the accent plus stains are also fairly low fusing. They could be lower, but let's see what happens. And then, of course, you need a cool down cycle. For any veneer zirconia with the newer lower fusing materials is really a cakewalk compared to how long it used to take a full arch of zirconia with porcelain on it to cool down. You might as well go have lunch because it takes two to three hours without inducing uh, some real stresses in it. So it's better to leave it alone. You need to buy another furnace. So you can work on your regular stuff while the other stuff's cooling down. That's just the law of the land. And of course, if you stain directly on the zirconia with stains to color it, you need to go quite a bit higher because the density of the zirconia takes forever for it to heat up and takes forever to cool down. So if you have a big arch or a big bridge with thick ponics and all this, you stain it and you say, oh, okay, uh, this is gonna look great. And then when it comes out, the stains look underfired. That's because it takes forever for the zirconia to heat up. And the firing cycles are like 400 to 750 in like five minutes. The big ponics don't heat up enough. So you have to preheat it longer and go up a little bit higher. If you just have zirconia, you can glaze it all the way up to 850 and nothing will happen. If you have a low fusing porcelain, you have to respect the high temperature of the low fusing material like Emacs Ceram or Lumex or whatever that other, Lisi or whatever it's called. Those things, you need to respect that because you can round them. The Lumex will not round. I mean, I haven't seen it round yet. And you have to make sure that that's gonna glaze. If you have a, a veneered crown, let's say a canine next to a premolar, you need to, you need to go to like 750, 760, but you're gonna to have to use some low temperature glaze on that bicuspid so it takes on the same sheen. If not, the stains themselves will not activate as nice on a full contour, bigger tooth, okay? What I did is I fired every stain that we had to every kind of temperature you can imagine. And if you see the slide on the left where it's 750, you can see a shiny piece of the glaze, LT glaze. This is a full contour zirconia test centrals. The pink stains did not take a shine very well. I had to go to 800 and I could still, you can see a little, it's just starting, okay? And some of the other stains I slopped on there to make sure. And so that's how I test stuff. I mill out a bunch of crowns and then I start messing with it. If you look on the left side of this crown with the pink on it, you can see how nice and shiny the glaze is. So the LT glaze is actually lower fusing than the stains. And you can actually mix a little of that to reduce the, to reduce the firing temperature. And I think if Gustavo is watching, I'm gonna send you this slide later. You see, I did it 740, 750, 760, 770, whatever until I would see like the pink getting a shine here, but it's not getting a shine here. And the white also, uh, it needs a little kick to get a little glaze on it. And Gustavo mentioned one more, but he, he can tell us later. Anyhow, that's, that's what I do. I sit here and I mess with this stuff. So when I tell people something, I'm not lying to them. I've tested it on a, on a perfectly calibrated oven. 
And so again, we don't know what it's supposed to look like because there's no samples. Oh, if you use this stuff, it's supposed to look like this. Nobody does that. So you got to do your own. So when you use full contour zirconia and you're glazing with the Accent Plus stains, the top temperature has to be around 800 and at least a minute hold. Then the larger the case, the longer you preheat it so it heats up enough. If you don't preheat it enough, it won't glaze as nice, especially big units. When you, when you veneer with uh, Lumex or anything else, you need to respect the high temperature of the veneering porcelain, which you could glaze at 750, 760, okay? Use your common sense. That's my furnace. So let's look at some big zirconia cases. We try, we, we, we do PMMA try-ins, we do a full uh, wax up or whatever you want to call it, digital. Then I put a bonding layer on there, not really a wash. I like my bonding layer to be a real thin layer. If you just slap it on there where you have, you see like it's not smooth, then you're not going to get the best bonding as far as I'm concerned because you need a layer to really lay on there and stick to it like mad, not a super thin one. I use the uh, modeling liquid from Lumex to paint this, and then I do the bakes. If I'm anticipating a few bakes, I keep the firing temperature on the porcelain as low as possible so that I don't stress it anymore. If you come out with shiny porcelain, shiny porcelain, shiny porcelain, it's no good. You need to low and slow. And here you see, trying to follow the matrix if I push down it it looks good and then I add just a little bit of color here and there after the first bake after I smooth it down set the stain I characterize the tissue with the accent plus pink dark and light and any tissue porcelain that I use I mix it at least 50 50 and sometimes 75 25 with clear porcelain from Lumex they need to put two bottles of clear porcelain in the in the gingival kits, whatever you're using. And here you see the tissue. This is a cancer patient. Uh, looks pretty decent, the tissue. See, it doesn't look uh, like bubble gum. Let's go to a couple of uh, how you shine these up. According to the studies by Christensen and and study by Glidewell, they glazed uh, Emacs crowns and zirconia crowns, Bruxier crowns, and they, they, they tested the wear on it. And after like six months, the, the glaze started to break down on the inclusal surface. So what I do is I take a water and I use uh, the old uh, Fumo 3 stain. And I just, with water, I put it in there and then I rub everything off with a brush. So everything falls way to the bottom. And then I polish the occlusal surface with these little uh, spirals with diamond chips in them. I get mine from Cardinal. And you can see on the left, you can see the glaze all the way around, but not on the occlusal table. So we try these in every crown, check the bite, make sure they're not high. And then we polish everything with these little guys. There's three steps, uh, rough, medium, and, and fine, and glow in the dark if you want. <laughs> and here you see, uh, central incisor. I'm going to do this for the third time. And this lady doesn't want to get her teeth bonded on the lateral. So the tooth is huge compared to this. And I did this. Um, it has an abutment now because she lost that tooth. And it's just, you can't make her happy. Look at the gingival crest on the prep. See, it should slant towards the distal a little bit. And, and it's much wider. So you, you have a fat chance. Here's nothing that you can do unless she, she cooperates. She needs to be able to bond this lateral a little, and then we can do something better. And the prep has to be canted towards the distal. Now let's see these Suprinity crowns. These are milled out. Those are the provisionals. These are glass. And I polish them with a rubber wheel and I can get them see-through. Then I fire these on a platinum tray, and what I do is I take the little wires, and I measure the width of the incisal edge, and I bend it, 
And then when I seat the crown, they don't bobble all over the place. And so I use that, that tray there. Sometimes uh, these come out a little bit too translucent. Uh, that's been one complaint, but God, do they look good in the mouth if you get it right. And so that's a perfect material for me to restore anterior teeth. If they had a few more shades, these Supreme crowns, you layer them with a VM11 porcelain and they're absolutely stunning. So I cut it with a disc from Cardinal on a water sponge and then I polish it. This is an exaggeration of this diamond on the upper right hand corner. But the reason I show that is a lot of people like to use a thinner diamond. And when that slips, it can dig in and make a gouge on your crown. So by using a larger than life diamond, it doesn't have to be that crazy thing. I'm just doing that as a joke. You take that sprue down and then you polish it with the old pre-polisher. That happens to be an aluminum oxide stone. That's a great pre-polisher. It works perfect for everything. And then this, you can polish it so smooth that you don't even need to glaze it. Good enough. Here's another central on abutment. Um, this guy had teeth that looked just like a porcelain. He's a uh, fisherman, a spear fisherman. And so that's a pretty basic. He has what's called a thin biotype so that the teeth are really long and tapered. And no matter what you do, your tissue is always going to recede. So most of the people that have thin biotypes always have black holes between their teeth. But you can see the finish. That's the old zirconia, the HT with VM9 on it. Lumex wasn't around yet. So you can do it. If you look at the lingual color of that zirconia, it's really opaque and ugly. Now look at this guy. This is an anodized titanium IC, stands for Individual Crown Framework. And that was done by Emanuele Piazzera uh, and or Luca, his nephew at Venetian Dental Studio. And then ProLab Aesthetics and I fin finished it off. So we get on Team Viewer and we do what we have to do. And this is Lumex with uh, zirconia, 4Y. And so the anteriors are characterized, the three posteriors are full contour zirconia. Now, the tissue is made with an accident, which is almost identical to the Vita light cure material, color and effects wise. And uh, this was a polished glaze, set stain glaze, and then I polished the glaze with, uh, with the, uh, those little diamond wheels, those little diamond spirals. And of course, you can see the difference. David Haley at ProLab did a beautiful job on the tissue. And then I built that uh, structure so that the papilla length is what you have to look for in these big cases. If you get the, if you don't get the contour of the papilla right, they'll be three feet long and they're terrible. So you have to let the papilla guide you. And here you can see the different colors that we used inside. Contrast blue, crack orange, blue crack orange, cream, blue crack orange. That's all you got to do. And you can match 99% of the teeth. Here's the other side. Four wiser conia layered with, with Lumex and Accent Plus internal color. So I use the accent inside, outside, or whatever. I didn't have any room because these are layered and there's hardly any space up here. We, we have the incisal edge that bites in zirconia. So that's the one way to do it. When you bond it, right after you bond it, you color it with a stain, set the stain, and then cover with, with clear. And here's the top. So this, Dr. Clary can take this on and off. And I'll tell you something, this case I think is gonna be cemented or screwed in next Tuesday. I am it's sitting there at the office. Now, five years ago, we did this patient's uppercase, which I've shown before. 
And this was made by Cogenix, which is in Nashville. They do a good job. You can see the preps are quite uh, rectangular in shape. And this guy had massive bone loss and everything. So we decided to do IC frames. And when you send stuff to Cogenix, they do their own zirconia. And this time they used, this is five years ago, they had three Y. And they anodized it, but it came out copper looking. It's just a voltage thing, but who cares? We did it anyway. Then we wax it. And then you see the bonding layer. It's, a, it's not a wash, it's a little layer. And you can see the incisal edges are done. And so I get that real nice high sheen on it. And with that, I can aerobrate this barely before I put porcelain on it because it's so slick that when you're building up, you can push off the whole porcelain. That's happened to me before. And I use it in the pins and I just let it float. If not, I put just a little dabble do you of the paste. So here you can see that the way we designed it is to have the zirconia all the way out to contour. We don't have any layered porcelain all the way by the gum. We don't have to if the color's right. And then we go ahead and, and use uh, the, the VM9 in this case. Now see here, these implants were coming out the facial of the two. So what Dr. Clary decided to do is to splint these two. And then we temporarily cement it. So when the, when the patient comes in, we can unscrew it, clean everything up, and back it goes. So that's how you get around having non-parallel abutments. And you can see the difference in the color of the zirconia from the one that I just showed you to the 3Y. You can see how it's kind of dead looking compared to the 4Y, which is a lot more translucent. But you can't really tell that in the mouth, but that's the only thing we had to work with back then. And this used Ivocap. This is, this is, Ivocap is from Ivoclar, and that was processed. And David did not use the fibers, but this is the finished case. These are the two that are temporarily cemented, number six and seven. And the bottom is a denture that we replaced with that beautiful bridge I showed you earlier. So let's look at a little bit of framework design. So you have a little bridge like this. If a doctor wants tissue porcelain and they want these bridges to look good, they really need to do a little better on the tissue work. They need to have ovaponics. Don't, no, don't have this roller coaster crap. And so it's really difficult to get them to do this for some reason or other. And so this is the Lumex gingival mixed with clear 7525. I believe I used 233, which is nectarine or some crazy name and i still have to polish oh i had to polish when i took the picture i use these little